Today, FDA approvals of a biosimilar and a direct-to-consumer genetic test, a breakthrough designation in marginal zone lymphoma, a complete response letter in triple negative breast cancer, and supplemental biologics license applications in multiple myeloma and non-small cell lung cancer. Welcome to Enclave News Network, I'm Gina Columbus. The FDA has granted an approval to the trastuzumab biosimilar SB3, known by the trade name Ontruzant, for the treatment of patients with HER2 overexpressing breast cancer or metastatic gastric or gastroesophageal junction adenocarcinoma. The decision is based on data sets from seven trials that demonstrated similarity in survival outcomes and safety between SB3 and trastuzumab in patients with HER2-positive adjuvant and metastatic breast cancer, as well as HER2-positive metastatic gastric cancer. Phase three data on the biosimilar showed that it elicited a rate of breast pathologic complete response similar to trastuzumab in patients with HER2-positive breast cancer. Results also demonstrated comparable safety outcomes. In the per-protocol population, 51.7% of patients achieved BPCR with SB3 versus 42.0% with trastuzumab. The adjusted BPCR ratio was 1.259, which was within the predefined equivalence margins. In the intent to treat population, the BPCR rate was 49.0% in the SB3 arm and 39.7% in the trastuzumab arm. The adjusted ratio of the BPCR rate was 1.243, and the adjusted difference in the BPCR rate was 9.59%. The FDA has cleared a direct-to-consumer genetic test for a risk report on MUTYH-associated polyposis, a hereditary colorectal cancer syndrome, manufactured by the personal genetics company 23 in May. The approval will allow the company to report on the two most common genetic variants that influence MUTYH-associated polyposis. Upon its release, the test will be offered to new and existing customers of Health and Ancestry Service. The MUTYH-associated polyposis genetic health risk report included at least a 99% accuracy and utilization of key informational concepts that achieved 90% or greater comprehension in a demographically diverse population. This decision follows the FDA's March 2018 authorization for 23andMe's BRCA1, BRCA2 selected variants genetic health risk report, which tests three selected variants in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Similar to the BRCA1, BRCA2 report, customers of the service must choose whether or not they want to receive this information. The report will also include an education module with information on the risk report, its limitations, and how to interpret their results. In marginal zone lymphoma, the FDA granted umbralizumab, a breakthrough therapy designation for the treatment of adult patients who have received one prior anti-CD20 regimen. The designation is based on interim data from a cohort of the ongoing registration-directed Phase II Unity NHL trial that is evaluating the PI3K Delta inhibitor as a single agent in patients with MZL. The Phase IIb Unity NHL clinical trial is investigating umbralizumab as monotherapy or as part of a doublet or a triplet in patients across a number of relapse refractory NHL subtypes. The doublet includes the CD20-targeted monoclonal antibody ublituximab while the triplet includes ublituximab and bundamustine. The trial is enrolling patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, small lymphocytic lymphoma, and MZL. Umbralizumab is being tested as monotherapy in FL, SLL, and MZL, while the DLBCL subtype is being treated with doublet or triplet therapy. Prior data demonstrated promising outcomes with umbralizumab monotherapy and in combination with ublituximab and primalizumab in patients with relapse refractory chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The FDA has issued a complete response letter to Immunomedics regarding its biologics license application for sasituzumab govitecan as a treatment for patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer who have received at least two prior therapies, citing chemistry, manufacturing, and control matters. Previously, the agency granted a priority review designation to the application for sasituzumab govitecan in July 2018 and was scheduled to make its decision by January 18, 2019. The application was based on phase two findings, which demonstrated that the antibody drug conjugate elicited an objective response rate of 34% in patients with heavily pretreated MTNBC. Additionally, the ORR was accompanied by stable disease for at least six months and 11% of patients for an overall disease control rate of 45%. The median progression-free survival with sasituzumab govitecan was 5.5 months, and the median overall survival was 12.7 months. 
In non-small cell lung cancer, the FDA accepted a supplemental biologics license application for atezolizumab, carboplatin, and napacotaxel as a first-line treatment for patients with metastatic non-squamous disease. The application is based on data from the Phase 3 Empower 130 trial, which demonstrated a statistically significant improvement in both progression-free and overall survival versus chemotherapy alone in patients with stage 4 non-squamous NLCLC. The agency is expected to make a decision on the approval by September 2, 2019. The interim findings show that the atezolizumab arm was superior in overall survival in the intent to treat wild-type population. Here, the median OS was 18.6 months versus 13.9 months with carboplatin and napaclitaxel alone. The one- and two-year OS rates with atezolizumab were 63.1% and 39.6% versus 55.5% and 30.0% in the carboplatin and napaclitaxel arm. There was also an improvement in progression-free survival with the atezolizumab combination. The median PFS was 7.0 months and 5.5 months for carboplatin and napaclitaxel alone. Moreover, the 6- and 12-month PFS rates also favor the atezolizumab arm at 56.1% and 29.1% versus 42.5% and 14.1% with chemotherapy. The overall response rate and median duration of response was 49.2% and 8.4 months with the atezolizumab regimen versus 31.9% and 6.1 months with chemotherapy. A supplemental biologics license application has been initiated with the FDA for the combination of daratumumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone for the treatment of newly diagnosed patients with multiple myeloma who are ineligible for high-dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplant. The application is based on data from the Phase 3 Maya study in which the triplet regimen reduced the risk of disease progression or death by 44% versus lenalidomide plus dexamethasone alone in this patient population. At a median follow-up of 28 months, the median progression-free survival had not been reached with DRD compared with 31.9 months in the RD group. The PFS rate at 30 months was 71% versus 56% respectively. Additionally, the overall response rate was 93% with DRD compared with 81% with RD. The stringent complete response rate, CR rate, and very good partial response rate were all higher with DRD versus RD. The partial response rate was higher in the RD versus DRD group at 28% versus 14% respectively. The minimal residual disease negative rate was greater than threefold higher with DRD versus RD at 24% versus 7% respectively. This week, we sat down with Dr. Joyce O'Shaughnessy of Baylor University Medical Center to discuss future roles of PARP inhibition in breast cancer. We now have two FDA-approved PARP inhibitors for use in clinical practice in women with germline BRCA HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer, Olaparib, and now very recently, Talizoparib. And these agents show their highest effectiveness in the earliest treatment of metastatic germline BRCA metastatic breast cancer. For example, the, in the Olympiad trial with Olaparib at AACR, Mark Robson updated Olympiad and showed that women who received Olaparib as first-line treatment versus chemotherapy of physician's choice had a very large improvement in survival. There was also a tail on the survival curve that was very intriguing, whereas women who were receiving the PARP inhibitor versus chemotherapy later in the course of their metastatic disease did not have an improvement in survival. Again, this is, these are exploratory analyses, but it was very interesting to see this improvement in survival. So we want to be using the PARP inhibitors as early as possible in metastatic breast cancer patients who have a germline BRCA mutation. And that will mean for triple negative breast cancer patients whose breast cancers are PDL1 negative, that we should probably be using Olaparib or Talizoparib in the first line setting. For those who have a PDL1 positive triple negative breast cancer, there is a survival advantage with the checkpoint inhibitor atezolizumab, so we'll likely utilize the NAB paclitaxel and the atezolizumab, but upon stopping the uh, NAB paclitaxel, it, it may be very reasonable to add the Olaparib at that point, perhaps even along with the checkpoint inhibitor because we do have adequate safety. Um, and for patients with ER positive germline BRCA metastatic breast cancer, Generally, we will start with a 
endocrine agent plus a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And if the patients have indolent disease and have done very well, we may go on to a second line uh, endocrine therapy, such as alpelosib if they have a PIK3CA mutation in the breast cancer or everolimus. But if they have more virulent disease, then I think it'll be important to get the PARP inhibitor um, in as a next treatment because the sooner we use these, the greater the impact and the more durable the responses will be, and hopefully that'll translate into survival for our patients as well. That's all for today. Thank you for watching Enclave News Network. I'm Gina Columbus.